we're live. So good afternoon. On the show to, to, with us today is a phenomenal public speaker, a compare TV host, radio host. Her name is Ayo Mariasi, but I'm sure she doesn't need introduction to most of the people that are listening. Hi, I'm Ayo. Nice to have you on the show with us today. Hello. Hi, Bumi. Good to be on the show. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm so um, honored, delighted, and I'm looking forward to a truly interesting conversation. Great. Fantastic. So um, I thought it would be nice to talk to you basically because you're a public speaker. And I know many people would wonder why I'm, inter I'm interviewing you because my show is about um, entrepreneurs and making business and, uh, you know, things like that. But I believe there's an art to public speaking and there's a business to creating and maintaining a brand, which is, I think, something that you, you have done pretty successfully. So I wanted to start by asking you, how did it all start? How did you know you wanted to go into public speaking full time? Right. Okay. So do, do, I think it was the I, when I knew, I would say that was when I found that I, I enjoyed doing it. I'd, done, I'd hosted events and spoken publicly for free, as it were. Um, I just really enjoyed doing it. So in the course of my work, I would usually be called on to come and host at the office. And I worked with a community organization, a not-for-profit, where we had a lot of events. And then we also had a lot of training programs for organizations, government agencies. So I did that often, and I really loved it. I remember the first time I was, uh, you know, they said, oh, we, they, there's a budget for the MC. And I'm like, okay, so this is, this is an opportunity. So I guess I would say that it was just a passion i wouldn't even call it passion it was just something i really enjoyed doing and i did quite well based on the feedback from people and i thought okay yes why don't you just explore this as an opportunity to do what you love and do it well and earn money from it okay so um i wanted to ask you because you you, you speak so eloquently it's almost like it's innate in you you know, so you would you say that this is a natural gift as in it's not that you deliberately train to be able to speak in public? Okay, so there's the natural part where I'm I'm you know, I'm a Christian, so I would often refer to I would often refer to my beliefs and my values, which are founded on my faith. And I used to call myself an accidental broadcaster or an accidental, you know, well broadcaster I would say, until I started to realize that actually our lives are, God is so intentional about our lives. So from a very young age, I now begin, I, I've, 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 I have now seen that there was a part he was charting for me, even when I wasn't aware. So I'm grateful for, right from the primary school I went, for some reason, they were very particular about um, spoken English and the way we pronounce words. It wasn't, it was a school in, it was a beautiful, great school in, in Suruleri. It didn't have a big name. But the founder was a trained educationist who was very particular. So we actually had an elocution teacher who came every week just to teach us how to pronounce words. We had, during our English classes, we would have reading tests. So we were taught the art of reading, how to pause, how to... I don't know if many schools do that today, right? And I remember that I just... That was what piqued my interest in, in, the, in, in the language and wanting to speak well. And I excelled at that time. I remember I was, I was chosen to represent, to speak, or to read citations at maybe end of year school and all that. I remember the first time my mom came to school and I was picked to, to read it. She said that she was read, she, she heard a voice and then she looked up and it was me. She couldn't believe that it was me speaking because obviously I was speaking now professionally the way I'd been taught. Honestly, I can't, what was, I can't remember, what was the name of that class? There was a, the name we used to do every Friday, we'd go to the hall and there was a paid elocution um, coach who would come to, they weren't called elocution co um, coaches at that time, but she would come and teach us how to pronounce words, you know, very well-spoken lady. And so as time progressed, I just had a keen interest in the English language. In secondary school, we had a fantastic teacher, Mr. Bolo, who was particular and I loved his class and he loved because we excelled again. So we used to come top, I used to come tops in English class. Myself, Bodam Tayo, and another classmate of my Christina, um, Christina Joko. So we, he would always, it was so good that he would always give us, we had the same score every time. So he didn't want any discrepancy. 
So he would literally, if we all, if we got 86, all of us, me, three of us got 86. If we got 80, three of us got 80. So it was like that. And then I became part of the press club in secondary school. Uh, I was a science student, by the way. So I used to do debates and there you was know, something they called impromptu speech, whereby on Wednesdays, debating society, uh, literary, sorry, not press club, literary and debate, debating society. Literary and debating society was the only society in my school at the time that everyone had to belong to. Everyone was a member of. So you see the way it was that I was just being pushed. Even as I'm speaking, I'm just realizing that I was being pushed into just honing my speaking skills. And so would, the, the impromptu, impromptu speech was that on the day, the teacher would call me and say, you're going to be speaking in the afternoon on this particular topic and you had to prepare for it and speak. I know students and speak before a whole um, you know, before the entire school, students are not the kindest, you know, when it comes to things like this sometimes. So you, you'd be shaking, but you'd have to do it. And I, I found that I also did quite well there. So after secondary school, I thought, you know what, I'm not going to study medicine again, which was what I was going to study. I was in science class, I'm going to go into the arts because I really enjoyed the arts. I loved literature. I loved reading. I loved acting. Everything arty. You know, I loved it. So getting to, I went to uni in, I went to university at Swansea University in Wales. And a number of people, when they would travel abroad, would want to acquire a foreign accent. I remember for me, it was just about speaking well. Actually, I think it was a wise decision because I was 19 at the time. And I thought, you're too old to be acquiring a new accent that will sound genuine. <laughs> so why don't you, rather than sounding fake, just learn how to pronounce your words properly and speak good English. And, you know, there, here we are. So if you speak clearly, anyone can hear you from anywhere in the world. You don't have to have an accent. So I'm really, so that's, I just charted my journey towards that. So, yeah, I know that I believe that God had plans for me, even when I wasn't aware and he had been ordering my steps. My husband would call him the orchestrator of my life's journey. So he'd been orchestrating things to work together for the moment where, you know, to, for, to where I am now today. Fantastic. So I wanted to ask you how much of your brother's influence affected your, your, your journey or your decision, because I know I, I listened to him while I was younger growing <laughs> up. That's uh, Shola Thomas. So I wanted yeah. to know, did he influence you in any way? Do you think he was an influence on how you charted your course so far? Wow. So Shala Thompson was a brand, you know, we, he actually was, he was, he started working on, on radio f from first gen university. At that time, radio had just picked up really massively in Nigeria and was within 93.7. It was, you know, just, I just loved, I was, I'm very loyal as a sister supporter. So every time his show was on, I would put on the radio. I never, I'm telling, I never imagined I was going to be on on you know be a broadcaster i didn't think it was, i just thought you know i was going into the more formal aspect of working i never i didn't see it i just because it was picked i just thought you were you either had it or you didn't have it i wasn't looking but i just enjoyed and i'll support him every time i'll try and call him with that you know those um mono, is it those phones that you dial those white phones i'll dial him make sure call on his show listen out he used to do one movie critic he used to critic movies. So from, right from time, he's actually really been big on movies. And the, so I just really enjoyed listening to him. When I got back and I had an opportunity to work on radio, I then asked him, because this is the legend, how can I pass on, pass up the opportunity of asking him for tips? So he, I just asked him, okay, he should share tips with me. But, but the thing was, we weren't doing the same kind of, the, the same genre of, me, of, of radio. So I was going more into politics, current affairs. He'd, oh, he was a night king. He was R&B, music. He's a music genius. He's an art. My, 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 my brother is a genius when it comes. He's an art genius. His mind, the way it works. So I asked him for tips, and he gave me a few tips. He would listen in sometimes and say, oh, you, you know, do it this way, do it that way. So in that way, that was how, you know, he's influenced my radio journey. But honestly... I was just happy being Shola Thompson's sister. I was just happy. I, he was, let me even tell you one thing that happened. I hope you won't get into trouble now. But just to, just to digress a little and to show how I was enjoying the benefits of being his sister. I remember in those days, many years ago, when the, the, the reigning champions and Two-Face had just come out really big and I was so in love and I loved him, you know. So I just used the opportunity. Actually, you know, my brother is a, is a radio 
presenter, he's a radio star. So I told him to give me two faces number. That I just want to call him to just, you know, just fan moment, fans. And I was like, okay, I'm giving, but don't tell anybody. Don't tell my <laughs> So I just called him out of the blues. I said, oh, I just really love. And he was so gracious. He didn't even ask. Like, you get my At that time, we didn't have, the celebrity status wasn't like this. And I was just elated to be speaking to my, I, I, I call him crush, but two-faced. So that was, those are the perks of being Shola Thompson's sister. <laughs> but yeah, it's just, you know, so yeah, he's, he's, he's definitely a role model in, in broadcasting for me. Okay. Do you think um, one needs um, um, formal training to speak in public? And did you have to do, I know you had already said it, it was innate in you, but did you have to do anything formally to become good? And how do you improve yourself in general? Wow, thank you. That's true. Thanks a lot for asking that because I didn't touch on that. I was charting my journey, but in terms of honing my skills, largely self-taught, but deliberately. So I didn't always speak like this, even when we when I started on radio. It's a consistent improvement. So I take on, I I run, I do online courses in terms of just watching tips on public speaking watch videos thankfully we live in a world whereby you can access tools online i also have role models that i really admire and i watch the way they speak i learn from them so in that way i'm consistently looking for opportunities to improve i understand that now this is my space so i want to own that i want to excel in that space so consistently working to improve so yes I would advise, so for me, my formal training came from, and, and that's why I mentioned that from right from school. But if you want to start now, there are many elocution classes that you can take. There are many people running courses like that online. There are many coaches, um, you know, spe speech coach coaches that you can access online here in Nigeria or anywhere in the world. So I would definitely suggest that um, if you don't speak the way you want to speak yet, you, you can certainly learn and become better online. Who are some of your mentors? Right. Okay. So the people I, when it comes to speaking, when it comes to hosting, presenting, the person, my most admired presenter is Ike Osaki Odua. Yeah. I like the way he's able to hold a room. I like the way he's, you know, to command a room, keep an audience engaged, how spontaneous he is. I also like his personality as well. His character. I've worked, I've had the opportunity to work with him a number of times and it's always been a learning experience. When I go to work with him, I'm just, I'm there to work, but I'm also there to learn. So I pick up points. He doesn't have to teach me directly. I, I learn a lot by observation. So I'm observing, I'm picking up tips, I'm picking up ways to do things. So he's really taught me a lot by observing him. So definitely I would consider him a mentor in this area. A lot. <laughs> I can imagine. So what determines what you do? Right. Okay. So it depends on, so for, I, I, as much as possible, I try to embody the events that I am, that I'm hosting. So if I'm hosting your event and you are in the financial services or you so you serve financial, you know, your a financial clientele, I would literally read about everything, learn the jargon, the specific words that are synonymous or that are, that are, yeah, that's synonymous to your industry. So when I'm speaking, you feel as if I'm a financial expert. If, I'm, if I were to host a medical event, I would learn the medical terminologies, read about the organization, rehearse, you know, practice names. I'm very particular about names. And I think that's something that broadcasting taught me because in broadcasting, you're not, you cannot, you're supposed to know how to pronounce people's names, irrespective of the kind of names that come your way. That is part of being a professional or being professional. So those are some of the things that I, I do. I read up massively. And again, my background in broadcasting has helped me when it comes to public speaking or hosting an event in terms of the level of research that I do. And of course, my formal training at university I studied international relations where you read a lot, you researched, you um, used materials to present arguments. It was very, it's very instrumental to what I do today. So research is a big part of it. I research a lot, read widely on the speakers, read on the topic of conversation, read on the organization itself and um, 
con I'm consistently reading in terms of news from different channels. I have news alerts that come to my phone every day. So I'm kept abreast of what's going on around in terms of current affairs. Okay. How do you keep your audience engaged? How you, you don't know who you're speaking to, so you don't know their preconceived ideas. So how do you how do you know what to say? How to keep them engaged? All right. I think at this level, it would be, I would say definitely uh, after it's down to a lot of practice, having worked with a number of or engaged a number of a wide variety of audience or audiences. However, for when I first started, I actually genuinely like people and I genuinely like talking. <laughs> so um, I can be a spontaneous radio. I can be talking. And that's another good thing about being widely read whereby you have, you're able to speak to a number of topics or conversations. So I can, I can stand, I can literally stand in front of an audience and speak for maybe five hours, just by picking random things and asking questions. And just, I love interviewing people because I like, I, as I mentioned, I really like people. So I like to get things out of people. I listen quite well. So I'm talking to you and I'm picking out so you can say, oh, the red, imagine the blue dress today. Do you know what happened the other day? So I can go on and on and on. So in that way, but an important part in terms of engaging a formal audience when it's work is understanding. So read up about your audience. I try to know the kind of audience that I have so that I know the kind of content to present to them and all the possible worst case scenarios when something goes off, the microphone isn't working. I get them. I can get you to do activities, stand up. Let's do it. If you're happy and you know, it, just anything. So one of the great things to have and to be able to do and which I've gotten feedback about, you know, at events is spontaneity, being able to think on your feet, especially when things go wrong and you need to fill in the gaps. At that time, the MC host, broadcast, anything becomes the say, miracle worker. You have to just find a way. And then your, your KPI is measured against how well you were able to handle and manage that situation. So yeah, be able to talk about any and everything. Yes, be, be willing, read widely. Someone begins to talk about the politics of this nation. You have something to say about it. You know what's going on in Kenya because you've heard, even if you don't have an in-depth knowledge, the fact that you're able to pick one word and then listen so that you're able to pick something else from what the other person said to respond to is a great skill to have. Okay, okay. So that, that's, that's interesting. I was going to ask you, do you think it's important to story tell during occasions or in any public um, event I, that you are? And how, how, do you, how do you become good at storytelling? Again, I would say down to practice. I, I think, first of all, to answer your first question with regards to is it important, I think it's such a powerful tool for public speaking, the ability to tell stories. One other person I admire in terms of the way she speaks is Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. And she's a storyteller. Obviously, she's a storyteller by the nature of what she does and her gifting. But also, I find that whenever she gives a speech, she often weaves in stories. One of the things that you do or you, you want to do when you're standing before an audience is to get them on your side in terms of finding that person personality and making them feel comfortable with you being on stage and addressing them or being in front of them and ad addressing them. And one of the ways in which you draw people in is by telling stories and just sharing. It makes people comfortable and it makes you comfortable as well. So people are able to relax irrespective of how formal the event is. So relax doesn't mean informal. It just means people trust you a bit more to want to listen to you and enjoy you speaking to them. So I would absolutely recommend that in terms of using storytelling as a tool for speaking in public. And how can you build that? Again, I can't emphasize enough the importance of reading widely and, being, and keeping abreast of things. So one of the things that I think I believe works well for me is being able to pick out things from situations. So thinking on your feet. So as I'm looking at you, Bumi, I'm thinking, oh, you know, Bumi, I like the way you smile. I can pick up things from our conversation now and just begin to create a conversation from that, right? I can pick up things from your hair. Oh, what, I, you made your hair. Like, I remember the time I made my hair. I did this hairstyle. This color is becoming. You just begin to create conversation from that. So you can, be, you can start doing this with, with the people around you. So you get used to 
conversing with them, telling them stories. Even, you know, if you look at, for those who are Christians, Jesus was a storyteller and he passed many salient messages through story, through the art of storytelling. So it is so, even if you don't remember the message, or if, if you, if you find it difficult to remember the message, if it's weaved through a story, it's easier to remember. So you'd always be able to associate what they said with the story they told. And that is that leaves a lasting impression. And the same goes with public speaking. So you can open up the story. I remember, you know, who was read in fact let me, a cheat script. There are stories online that you can just go and borrow. Just pick a story online, use it on you. So you don't have to get your own stories. You can just Google stories for you know speeches and they'll tell you anecdotes, stories that you can use when you're speaking. And it helps a lot. Okay. Is comedy important? Because I'm just thinking that if you're not a comedian, you're not a funny person, <laughs> it might be difficult <laughs> to be spontaneous with comedy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, comedy is, is good. Everything with everything with, in moderation. So I often say that as a, as, a, as a public speaker, you don't have to be a comedian. However, you should have a good sense of humor. So be able to quip in words or be able to... So that's the thing about spontaneity something that's happened and you're able to joke about it. You're able to make light and people have a little giggle or a little, there's a little laughter. I don't have to give you like uh, stomach roaring, ha ha ha, did you do the moment? I just need to be able to associate little happenings and inject in, or infuse a light sense of humor there. So a good sense of humor is definitely a plus when it comes to public speaking. We don't have to be a comedian. If you're a comedian, it helps a lot because when you have those awkward moments of silence, you can just go into a joke and everybody loves, you know, light moments of laughter. So it's a win-win for you. But even if you're not a comedian, you can make sure you find your funny bone. Find that funny bone in you whereby you're, again, it is being able to pay attention. If you're going to be a good communicator, you must be a good listener. You must be observant because everything around you then becomes material for you. And people find that really intelligent when you're able to use things around you or be spontaneous with your conversations without what is rehearsed. There's some moments you pick them up and you're able to use those moments to shine as a public speaker. Okay. So, so let me talk about your brand. Um, I remember when I first heard you on uh, Smooth FM, you know, I was used to, I don't know if they do it deliberately, but I was used to hearing foreign voices on uh, Smooth FM. So when I heard yours, it was Nigerian, but it was clear, it was likable, it was eloquent. I thought, oh, this is different. At least they're now using <laughs> homegrown um, um, <laughs> on-air personalities, but you even school that broad, so you still meet <laughs> their criteria, really. But so um um are you deliberately creating a specific kind of brand and how how do you do that absolutely thank you so i i think for me thank you i think that's such a great compliment i want to start i want to sound authentic i want to sound original and i'm such a big advocate for that we we, we must get to the point whereby we are proudly nigerian and we own it I don't know, you know, I, I, if you leave, I can talk about this for a long time that you can, and you, you can sound authentic and likable. In fact, people want to hear themselves in you because then, remember I said to you that you want to draw people in. Yeah, people can like, you know, foreign accents and so on. I can't, let me know, I can't say that's what Smooth was going for. I know they wanted, to, they, they had a particular sound, but they weren't, I wouldn't particularly say they were discriminating. It just happened that way. However, no one can argue with someone who speaks well and who speaks intelligently. And so that was what I was gone in for, that it's a cheap way to just acquire an accent and think that you're a great radio personality if you don't have personality in itself. So, um, yeah, I would say that definitely. Now, going to my brand, one of the things I'm, I'm very, I'm big on branding because it's something I also have a, an inkling towards helping people, you know, carve out their brand, maximize their brand, communicate their brand. So for me, one of the ways I'm able to do that, or I do that consistently is to articulate or really spread out what the things that I stand for. So perception, if people, what's your perception of me and what kind of image would I want to project? 
what do I stand for? So that's very important. There are a few things I stand for. So I'm consistently checking with the things that I say, what, how the words that I use, what I post online, if it's consistent with what I stand for. So that I'm, con- I'm pushing that. So that when you think of Ayo Myra essay, there's something that comes to mind. So I remember even I have a website where I you can go on there and feel me, as it were. So my personality, the things that I stand for, the causes I I I I um, am passionate about, those things are online. So really important to to focus on that. You don't have to be like anyone else. You must you must find your identity and push that identity. It may not even be popular, but when you're consistently driving your message, people will come to respect it and recognize you by that. I think it's really important to define yourself. So for instance, for me, you're the money buff. I love it. Even if I don't remember your name, if I met you for the first time, I remember the money buff. So anything money, I won't speak to Bumi because this is how she has projected herself and she is consistently pushing that narrative so that you're, you're not the money buff today, then tomorrow you're the social commentator, then tomorrow you're the sports enthusiast. Of course, you can have secondary passions. You can have secondary affiliations, but there should be one thing, there should be a primary thing that people know you for. And of course, your values, the things you stand for. I think, I'm, I won't say that I'm 100% in terms of pushing my brand, but I'm deliberately daily, in fact, daily pushing that in fact, before this interview, I was already writing some things down because I'm going into brand strategy. Okay, Ayo, what's the next level? How do you want to position yourself? What's your brand value? What's your brand proposition? What's your unique selling point? Things like that are, are, are what I'm consistently thinking about. Fantastic. So in terms of branding, I know you you worked in um, at Smooth for a while and also at um, Wazobia Max. Um, TV. Yeah. Which one did you prefer? Which one do you think uh, had the most impact in terms <laughs> of <laughs> pushing your brand and getting to where you are now? Okay, so I worked at Wazobia Max and Nigeria Info FM before I moved on to Smooth FM. They both played different roles in my life. Of course, Nigeria Info FM and Wazobia Max would always hold a special place in my heart because that was my first source into broadcasting. And I learned a lot. It was also while I was there that I won the Eloy Award for TV presenter, won the Future Awards for um, radio presenter. It was also there that I grew a lot. My growth process, I started, I thought I started off really strong, but when I watch my, my old videos, I'm like, what a rookie. How did you even get employed? <laughs> 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 But I grew, so I'm able to make. So it's you know how it is. I was like, smooth got the finished, almost the fin. I not finished product, but the refined product. Because I'm definitely not a finished product, refined product. So you'd always remember the one who shaped you, who carved you, who gave you the wings to fly. I can never forget. So while smooth gave me that balance, I was not able to come in in my own right, come on board in my own right as a broadcaster. But Nigeria Info Wazobia Max pushed me to the line, pushed me to the limelight, if I could use that word. And I had, it was a great platform for for learning. So I'm I'm grateful. So I'm grateful to Wazobia Max Nigeria Info. And I must say my MD, and let me, talking about that, can I speak about my, how I got into media or would that come on later? No, 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 it's okay. You can go ahead. I, I, I was going to chip in that I actually first met you, you might not know this, in church, City of David, because I attended City of David for about um, really? seven years before <laughs> before I left. So I, I no way. You, you started from <laughs> church, you know. <laughs> to be, yeah, yeah, I mean, to be fair, I did, because many of my, especially when it came to hosting, my gigs came from church. And part of the training process from a young age, I always encourage parents, please, when they're doing those children's, that's where I learned how to speak in front of, uh, you know, a crowd or an audience publicly. That's where I honed that skill growing up. Now, being an adult, I remember when I wanted, I got into TV, I wanted to go into TV broadcasting. So I saw that, I went for the audition, and my MD is, I would say that he has foresight, Mr. Engineer Amin Musali. I would never forget him in my journey or my, when I talk about my broadcasting journey, because 
had, he had done, he, he's very particular. He's, I mean, for you to have built a, an institution such as Cool FM, Wazobia FM, Nigeria Info FM, and then foray into TV and you're doing very well, you must know something, you must have something. He's eccentric, but I think you need a, a level of eccentricity if you're going to work in the arts or in media. So he would usually want to engage his talents. So when I did the interview, the final stage of the interview was meeting with him. So I had to meet with him. I had to speak to him. And, you know, he would engage you, speak to you. He would judge you. He would, he's asking you questions. He's a very intelligent and cerebral man, and he's very creative. So I mentioned to him that I'd studied broadcasting. And so I studied international relations. He'd asked if I could work as a producer, and I'd just spoken to him. On the day I was to start TV, there was an opening on radio, and... I didn't know that he paid such close attention to remember that I'd studied international relations. So he told them to call that lady who came on, you know, came to meet him that she studied international relations so she can do him, she can do morning radio where you had to talk politics and current affairs. And that's how I, so he gave me a chance. I would say I didn't apply for radio. I'd never done radio before. And he told me to go on air. <laughs> So he had faith in me. I don't know if he had faith in me or he just took a chance. If you if you are not good, remove you from air. But I'm forever grateful for that opportunity uh, and that he remembered. Okay. Uh, that, that's that's a lovely story. It's one, it's one I would have asked you going along, but I'm, I'm happy you talked about it um, now. So I wanted to ask you, so which one do you prefer in hindsight? I'm assuming you're, you're self-employed now. You don't work for anybody. <laughs> That's no, fantastic. I, don't. I well, do contracts, well, so I'm a, I freelance. I'm able to work with. Or I'm not. I'm not. Um, I'm not opposed to working with people, but more, I do more work for myself now. Okay. Okay. So in hindsight, which one did you prefer, the being on um, TV or being on radio? Okay. So in hindsight, and even currently, hindsight, foresight, I'm a TV girl. So I started off on TV. That's what I enjoy doing. However, my most challenging aspect of media is radio so i feel more accomplished whenever i do well on radio because i feel like it stretched me a lot and then i'm that's why i'm grateful i cherish the future awards you know because for me it was a it's a validation of the work that had gone on on radio and i cannot believe it's a testimony that i would actually be recognized in the area where i thought i struggled a lot more than i did on on tv and I stretched myself when it came to radio. So TV, I felt like, because I'd always done hosting, presenting, and getting an audience, you know, so TV was easier for me. But radio was a stretch. <laughs> so yeah, TV, definitely my first love. But radio definitely holds a special place because it, stre it stretched me more. So you would say that um, you, you require a different kind of skill to engage with people that you can't see or can't see you. Because I'm assuming that's why um, radio was a little bit more challenging. Oh, yes. Absolutely. So on TV, there are other things working for you. So you can be looking at someone and you just like a person's, you know, person, your, your looks. So part of TV, and that's one thing I really thank Wazobia Max for being particular about, your look. So nails, hair, everything on point. Already people are, before you open your mouth, people already like you. They've judged you and they like you. So whatever you say, you know, they already... On radio, you are judged only, <laughs> mainly by what you say. People are more critical. You know, they listen to you. And then, they, especially the kind of radio I was doing, there's a, even any form of radio, people expect that you're a portal of information. So you have to come correct all the time. You have to be well read. You don't say something well, and they call immediately, you're judged. They tell you, what, what did you say? I was rubbish. <laughs> so, you would always, you know, you'd go on air feeling like I had to have, I had to be on my A game. I had to have been well read up and then go on air. And then you can't, even if you make like grammatical blunders, you can't get away with it sometimes on TV because people are just, people are just mesmerized by everything that's going on on TV. There's lights, camera, by action. Yes. Even beyond you, you know, they're doing other things. There are graphics, motion graphics. Everything is working in your favor. You have a production team, radio. The tool of trade is your voice, how you're feeling, and what you have to say, and the content you have. So yes, that that's I found it more. I found I think radio is is is, is more intense than TV. That's what I think. Okay, fantastic. So let me move along to the business of 
um, being a public speaker. So how do you how do you get gigs? Do you pitch for them? Do they come your way because you're now um, more accomplished? How do you how do you do that? Okay, so thank you. So in terms of getting gigs, usually it would be yes, as you mentioned. I think I've been doing this for a while now, so I'm very grateful for clients who come back or through referrals. So referrals, clients have been able to establish, relationships have been able to establish through the years, and then people seeing you at events as well, whereby, oh, so I also get, so again, that's a, that's a sort of referral because you do well at an event. Someone comes to meet you and say, oh, I would like you to host my event as well. So that's really worked. And then your public profile. Sometimes people literally just go online and Google and search MC in Nigeria or Lagos or go on LinkedIn, especially if they're, if they're new in the market and they haven't worked with the Nigerian audience or worked in that space before and they're thinking, I need an MC. Okay, let me search. That's why I believe that when it comes to that line of work or any line of work, to be fair, have a, a, have a public profile. This is where branding comes in as well. When people, so I see my Instagram page, for instance, as my website, as my online CV. You, because literally people go on and say, oh, okay, I checked your website, I checked your Instagram, and it could be the deciding factor whether people choose to go with you or use the services of another person who may not even, you know, be as experienced, but they have such a great public profile. So your pub, your branding online, very important. So yes, those are the ways I get jobs. Referrals, a lot. Established clients and just, just um, online searches. Okay, let me ask a question. For someone that hasn't been um, a broadcaster before, either on radio or TV, but loves to compare or to host programs, how do you advise that person to um, get gigs? How, how does that person push their agenda, so to speak? Brilliant, thank you. So uh, I was, I, 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 I actually started off as a compare before I go. In fact, it was comparing that, gave me that boldness to say, okay, let me try a career in broadcasting or hosting or hosting TV shows. What I would say is that, and as, as I often tell people, because I've met people who are in a form of, who are in the corporate sector and want to diversify or have this as a side gig, as we call it, to host, because they have a flair for it. I would say that take every opportunity. This is where the church part that you mentioned earlier on when we were the first place you probably saw me hosting an event, I would ask, tell them that in your offices, when they have maybe end of year team meetings, staff meetings, volunteer yourself. Let That's how you get known initially that you can do it. From there, you then begin to host maybe events that they'd rather, they would have paid an external MC to think, oh, okay, I are in accounts can do this. Let's call her to do it. You do it, you do it well family functions host for free you do it for free just do it that's how i started i didn't start off with the platform of of broadcasting that's why whether i'm in broadcasting or not this is something i've been doing for for years even prior to broadcasting once you're able to once you know your work do it so i did church gigs without some of them without being paid of course many of them they are hosting they're hosting oh i can do this i come and host for us we're having a, a family event. Ayo, games master, come and do it. They wouldn't even have to call me sometimes because sometimes you have to push yourself forward for people to recognize that you have this skill or talent or you have this interest. So volunteer yourself. I often tell people who are in corporate organizations, tell your team lead that I can do it. And then don't fold their hand. Don't disappoint. <laughs> Prepare and do it well. So that when you're doing it, oh, and oh, we know this person. So I, I've met many people who've been able to make that successful transition from working in the corporate sector to hosting events because they, first of all, in the trenches, you know, when they were unpopular, we're doing these things and people acknowledged, saw it, they, and they thought, okay, I could do it. And you know, people are always looking for a bargain. So when yeah. they're looking for a bargain, they think, oh, rather, rather than going with a well-known, uh, with a known, a branded or a known uh, compare, let me come with, to this person. I know they won't charge me that much and they're good. Then you begin to build trust build relationships and carve a niche for yourself in that area. Okay. 
So as a, can you tell us about your experience getting the gig at Dubai? I think it was the International Women's um, Leadership Conference. From, yes. I think from Wimpy. Yes, it was. Yes, the high. Yeah. You already said it was from, that was, those are one of those events that, that came from, from, an, from an event that I'd done that was good. So at Wimbies, I'm very grateful for that platform. I remain very grateful. It's a very powerful platform. And I was asked, I remember the day I got the email to be one of the hosts for the year's conference. I was so excited. It was a big deal for me. There are some platforms that you remember and you never forget because they are, you know, they're quite great. And so when I went there, fortunately, Mrs. the two women, who played a who have played such a huge role in that in that pushing forward, Mrs. Yewande Zakios of Eventful and Mrs. Ibukwa Woshika, who is the convener of the International Women's Leadership Conference. And they're women who are also passionate about pushing women forward. So I remember at the end of day one, I got so many positive feedbacks. Feedback. So I got a lot of um, um, positive feedback. And second day after the event. Both women are founding trustees of Wimby's. And Mrs. Siwande Zakios came to meet me and said, you were fantastic. There's something coming up. You know, we're always looking for female MCs. Where have you been all this while? Don't worry, man, you were going to work together. I was honestly, I, I can't, and I'm very shy. Let me not lie. It's taken a lot for me at an event not to run You could off. have fooled me. What? I am very shy. Usually, immediately at an event, I'm running away because I can't handle... With that said, I can't handle compliments are good, but I'm just I don't know how to respond sometimes. <laughs> it's that imposter syndrome. So I want to just run away and just so I ha I have to school myself that part of the work I do is networking. I have to be able to network. So that's something I'm almost forcing myself to do. So yeah, she came and I was really touched. And she said, I'm going, let me get your contact. I will contact you. I know how it is. Sometimes people tell you I'll contact you, you don't hear from them again. It's it's the way it's the same with businesses across board. It's like how people ask for they'll DM you and say, What's the price? And then you have a conversation and then nothing comes up. But but she set out and then she took me to me. Oh, she can say, This is the lady, that thing we're doing. You know, that thing she was excited. This is the woman for it. So I was excited. I was just so me oh, she can't hear. I said, Oh, yeah, she greeted me. I didn't hear from them for a few weeks or months. I just after that, I just got to pray about it that Lord, you know, the the ears where I can't speak, speak for me. Because sometimes it could start that way and then along the line, it's happened a number of times. So I got the call or the um, contact saying, oh, this is what it was for. So Mrs. Zakios had told me that something is coming. It's big. It's big. And she, if you know Mrs. Zakios, she's very, she's an animated speaker and she's passionate. So when she's speaking to you, she's telling you, don't worry. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I can't wait. What could it possibly be? And, you know, heard that she, Mrs. Awashika was going to be doing this conference, the first edition in Dubai. And I was, of course, and I heard when they contacted me later, I was so excited about it. So I am grateful, very grateful to Mrs. Zakios and Mrs. Awashika who gave me that opportunity. And of course, tiny back to where they'd seen me host. So wherever you have an opportunity, you never know who's watching. I didn't have a clue that there was a conference coming up. I didn't have a clue that they were watching. I was just doing my job and enjoying myself on stage. I enjoyed hosting that event. So I enjoyed myself on stage and here we are. So I thank God for that. Great story. Fantastic story. So let, let me ask, how, how do you make money? What are your revenue streams? I know you compare, but for someone that wants to do this full time how do you suggest they go about making money because you you have so many gifts and there's so many places that you can speak in public so what channels do you do you have for making money okay so currently i'm i'm even looking for ways to expand my income stream because the world the it, the, the industry is an ocean just come and drink up drink up <laughs> I often say that there's there's a lot of potential, and I'm glad that in Nigeria we're seeing more, we're seeing more and more the importance of having a good host or someone to steer your event as a public speaker. We not we even have speaking fees for people to come and address your audience or give a keynote, so that's really important. 
I wouldn't say it's easy, just as with any industry, you have to be outstanding for you to command the kind of fee that will make you happy at the end of the month, that even though I don't have a formal job, I'm good. It's, it's also, um, there's a, a process. So you'd always have the people who, is it not just MC? I just want you to talk, just say two minutes. Just, it's not really long. You're just there to moderate. And I'm like, two hours. Why are you charging me that? I'm like, you're not paying for two hours. You're paying for the amount of time I would use to rehearse and the experience I bring to bear to your event. Just as you wouldn't say that, oh, you're, the, the MD and the cleaner, they're doing the same nine to five now. Why are you paying this one? <laughs> What you're paying is for the responsibility and the experience and expertise that person brings and the capacity to make you make more money. Yeah, so those things people don't consider yet sometimes. Some people have an appreciation for it, so they don't argue with you. They know that, yes, because they, maybe they've experienced an event where they were me something messed up their event, so they don't want any story, any, you know, no stories. So, you know, so what I would say is that the, the different channels, of course, hosting events, um, pushing with, with this sometimes it could be the frequency of events when you're starting out because you may, you may not earn a lot with one event. After a while you begin to streamline your, your, your area. There are some events or gigs you wouldn't take. One, either it doesn't align with your brand value. Number two, the money isn't good enough. You know, number three, it, it's your, you, the relationship isn't settled. So you begin to now pick the events that you go to because again, going back to that brand, brand um, value, you don't, you're not, you can't do every event. You can't, yeah. you can't call you on to open, you know, you can't do every event. So you begin, you're, you now get to a stage where you're able to pick the events you can do. And then another area that's opened up is also training people. So there are people who want to come on board, who want to, do you know who want to go into this you can train them at a fee you can train people at a fee and you can only do that as well if you yourself have trained yourself and you've improved yourself and you become sort of an authority in that field and are able to coach others to doing what you do then the other aspect is moderating events so there's a difference between hosting an event and moderating an event Moderators' fees vary depending on the level they'd like you to come in. Sometimes a, moderate, a moderator's fee is enough for you. <laughs> it's the same as hosting an event because it's very high level and there's a kind of moderator that they're looking for. So then you can make money um, from that as a moderator. You can moderate events. Moder as a moderator, they need someone who has who is able to speak to that subject oftentimes. You're able to engage thought leaders at that level. So that also helps you. And then you can decide to go into media as well. So you can create content. Another area that's picking up that's a money making <laughs> um, avenue is creating content. So you can decide to host your YouTube show, YouTube channel, have your own show, sell your content if you're doing it really well. And so the it's as, as much as you can get. It's as wide as you want to. That's the beauty of working in the arts. You are not limited. Your skills can, you can act, you can go into acting. You can, there's so many things. So how well, how far do you want to push yourself and what are your interest areas? The, the, there's no stopping you. That's what I would say. Okay. So I wanted to ask you, what were some of, or some, what are some of the challenges you faced in speaking in public? I think I would say imposter syndrome is one. The feeling that you're not good enough or your what if I what if I make a mistake fear is a big issue um so that's lack of confidence so those are some of the biggest challenges an audience that's not responsive <laughs> try all you want <laughs> um working with <laughs> um, sometimes even the client could pose a challenge there's some clients that you like working with because they're very professional so they make your work easier and there are some clients that they're all over the place, so they make your work harder because people will just say, what's, what's wrong with this MC? Not aware that you didn't probably get information. They are changing things last minute. You're getting information from 1,001 people, so you're not able. So things look very disorganized. That's not an MC's or a speaker's dream. You want, And there's some that 
your, you get your briefing notes ahead of time, you have your briefing meeting, you have sufficient information to work with, so you're just breezing through it, you're loving it. So sometimes your client can actually be a barrier, but guess what, you're professional, you have to be willing to work with any and any, you know, any kind of um, environment. And then in terms of your fears and that feeling of inadequacy, I often say that when it comes to public speaking, the first and most important thing to work on or to deal with is your mind. If you think it, it's, you, you will achieve it. So if you think you're not good enough, you will not be good enough. If you think you're going to make errors, you will not make errors. You will make errors. If you think you are worth it, you can do it, you will probably do it. So sometimes I give myself, myself pep talks before I go on stage. I, of course, I'm praying. I'm prayed up before I, 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 I commit everything into God's hands. And then you tell yourself, no, Ayo, the reason why you are hired to do this is because they recognize that you're good at this. You, you can even begin to remind yourself you did X, Y, Z, you're talented, you're skilled. What's the worst that could happen? You make a mistake, they don't call you back. That's not the end of your career. <laughs> I, I speak to myself. So literally, you have to be your own cheerleader even when no one is there. And then to avoid errors, mistakes, you practice, 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 practice. Get arrive at your event if you're speaking early so that you're comfortable when you're in a rush, you're scattered, and then you there's, you have propensity to make errors. But if you're settled, you understand your environment, you've had the opportunity to speak to people, you've greeted people, you've engaged with people already, you're feeling confident in yourself. And when you stand on stage, you're a bit more settled and relaxed to give a good presentation. So those are some of the things I would say, some of the challenges and some of the ways to overcome those challenges. Will you say as a rule of thumb you should have notes or is it unprofessional to have notes while speaking in public? It depends. If you're able to, go on. But the foolproof way <laughs> to not make mistakes is you can is to have some notes, maybe not a speech, but cues. And that's what cue cards are made for. And then it's not in your having notes, it's in the way you hold your notes. So one of the things I learned from IK was those lovely cue cards. He's the first person I saw doing it. And I thought, I'm going to print mine. So he would put little notes, little, so you don't forget someone's name. Because sometimes you think I won't forget. And then you get on stage and it literally, I've been at events where I skipped a section of the program. I'm like, what were you doing? Maybe the next thing was meant to be cutting of the cake and I moved on to vote of thanks. Okay, that's just an example. So the proof sure proof ways just have your notes take little notes so before then i prepared my notes already and if i'm able to if it's a short spiel i go on stage and i say it but if it's not i take my lovely card it's even it looks really professional and nice so i'm not holding a white piece of paper and looking like a rookie i'm holding a very professional nice cue card and so i'm reading and then don't read so we're going to know you already it's you, you wrote the notes yourself so you're familiar with it they're just keywords for you not to forget that's a better way of doing things when you watch all these public speakers or people very often they have a they have a a cue a cue in front of them so they're reading from a script they're reading and they're so but i prefer i, I i'm I, i'm very natural i like to present as being very natural so i try as much as possible not to read notes word for word i don't do my introduction you can rehearse it before you start you can have some key points for instance there are instagram you know social media handles hashtags for the day that's a lot of information to put in your head you can just write those things down so you don't forget or prompt little prompt don't forget to xyz don't forget after this do this and so you're just so you just glance at your notes look up and you do it fantastic so in rounding up any last words for us any advice you'd like to give to potential public speakers all right so for public speakers i think everyone everyone at one point or the other especially if you're a leader or an entrepreneur business owner, even as, a, as an employee, would probably speak publicly at one point or the other. So there's a public speaker inside of everyone. <laughs> what I would say is that you can do it. That's the first thing. No one was born with the ability to speak in public. 
yeah, some people have it easier than others because of a natural flair in that area. However, everyone has the potential to be a great public speaker. It, if, you, if, it's, if it doesn't come naturally to you, practice, they say, makes perfect. You can hone, it's a skill you can acquire and you can develop and become exceptional at. So please don't think, oh, that's old. People, I, heard, I heard and the likes are people that can speak in public. No, no one was born with the non-shy gene <laughs> or the confidence gene. Many of us had to build it up. So it's not too late to start. You can, if you've ever dreamed or wanted to, even if it's not to, as a, as a career path to make money from, you just want to be better so that when you stand in front of your board of directors or you want to defend a new project or a new idea, you want to be able to articulate yourself properly so that it makes money for you. So it may not be, you may not make money directly from it, but indirectly, because if you're able to pitch your idea or ideas properly in the business context, you're probably able to get more money from funders. When you go to, when you watch shows like The Den, Dragon's Den, sometimes the people who have great ideas miss out on funding because they were not able to articulate their plans and thoughts properly. So it's a money maker for you directly or indirectly. Find a way to develop yourself. There are many tools online. I host uh, coaching classes or speaking classes. If you don't want to do that, if you want to learn, just go online and, and improve yourself. There are opportunities to improve yourself to becoming a better public speaker. And whatever your hand finds to do, do it well. My teacher in primary school was one who first told me this and consistently said this to me. See as that a man diligent in his or her business, she will stand before kings and not before mean men. So right from the, from the very early years of life, hard work, diligence has always paved a way for people so diligence whatever your hand finds to do whatever craft you're doing put your best improve yourself continue learning even if you're the best and you're number one keep reinventing yourself keep asking yourself what's the next level what am i doing next what be a pace setter let people be running to catch up with you very important thank you very much Bumi. Thank you so much, Ayo. It's been a pleasure having you. It's been a pleasure indeed. Thank you.